my name is Oscar Norelius. I am an architect at White and the director for one of our studios in our Stockholm office. I am Swedish, but I grew up in Paris, which is why I speak French. And uh, I, today I share my time between Stockholm and Paris working on projects in both cities. Uh, I will try to focus as much as possible on my Swedish half tonight, given the circumstance of this conference. And this is a very Swedish thing to do, to start a conference on, or a presentation on urbanism with an image of a forest, because this is where we come from. And the Swedish approach to sustainability has very much been formed by the circumstances, both cultural and historical, of our nation. Uh, and in this case, what I would like to really put at the base of all of our projects is a certain closeness and care to nature. Can you hear me? Is it difficult with the microphone? Yeah. Um, so that's one thing. And the other thing is the climate that we have, which is very harsh, and the poverty that reigned in Sweden until the early 19th century. Um, and this actually led to very hard demands on craftworks and construction in Sweden. Uh, so this is very much part of our basics. And as times moved on and modernity hit Sweden, these, uh, this thoroughness and this uh, search for quality in construction and also this closeness to nature were institutionalized and became part of the system. So we today have lots of regulations and authorities that um, look after these issues. This image is from the first project that Sydney White designed in 1951. It's a residential project in Örebro, in the central part of Sweden. And I would like to show you this because the kitchen to the right is very much a result of the Swedish Domestic Research Institute that mapped the moves of the Swedish housewife in order to design the perfect kitchen. And ever since he won this competition with this proposal, we have been working with quality of life as a starting point for all of our designs. Today, as Dominique told you, our office is uh, a, a little bit over 800 team members, um, and we are entirely owned by the employees in the, in the business, in the firm. The motto for this competition proposal was, you can play, you are welcome to play in my backyard, and I think this is very, very relevant even today, this kind of motto. Because our cities are growing, and Stockholm is growing, Stockholm is the fastest growing city in Europe. It's growing twice as fast as London. So even though it's a much smaller city, if you strip the question down to its bare essential, it's the same challenge everywhere. People are moving to the cities. How do we develop our cities to, to remain as attractive as they are today and to become even more sustainable? And this is what we read into the um, notion of a healthy city. It's not only a sustainable city, it is also a city with a very big quality of life. So this is Stockholm, seen from the south. Let's see if I can find the pointer. Yes. And at the bottom of this, you can see the historic center up here. And basically, the Swedish peripherique is water. So if this had been Paris, the peripherique would have been right here, designing the, the outer edge of the core of the city. Now, at the bottom of the image, you can see the Hammarbyskjöstad development area that some of you may have visited. It's a very famous eco district. If you haven't been there, you should go there. And working on, we've, we've been very much involved in this development as well. I'm not going to talk about it especially tonight, but uh, working on our different commissions here, we came across a piece of land right below the bridge here that intrigued us, and we decided to design our own office building on this site to explore two things. The first is how can we live like we learn and design and sit in an office building that is sustainable in the true sense of the term, in the three senses of the term? And how can we transform this place into an attractive urban space? At the time, this was, you can see it's still under construction here, but just 10 years, maybe let's say 20 years ago, this was an industrial part of town that was very run down. It was a brownfield and it was unsafe for people to be here. So we took this challenge on. Let's see, this is working. And this is our office building today, where 300 of my team, teammates are working. Maybe not right now, but today. Um, the overall aim for the project was to create a sustainable building with low energy use, and that really has a positive impact on the site. And 
And the vision for this was to create an open, flexible plan with good indoor climate, good acoustics, um, and an overall good climate for work inside. Uh, this specific project is quite special because not only did we design the building, we also had it built. Um, we represented the client and the architect, as well as the interior architects, the environmental specialists, and the landscape architects. Sorry. Uh, so the aspect of generality was a very important aspect in this project. Um, we needed to design a building that could last for a very long time, at least 100 years. And uh, in order to do that, you need to work with the two terms of generality and flexibility. Uh, talking about a long-term sustainable building, you can divide it roughly into three parts. The first part is what we call society tide. It's the insertion on the site. It's the connections with the city infrastructure, the streets, the sewage systems, etc. And this needs to be viable during the entire lifespan of the, of the building because this you cannot change without profoundly or actually making a whole new building. The second part are the building tide parts, which basically constitutes a supporting structure. Uh, this also needs to have a very long lifespan before you need to redo it, because it's such resource demanding, both economically and um, ecologically. Let's say. And finally, you have the activity tide parts, which uh, are changed as often as 5 to 15 years to adapt to the ever-changing conditions um, of the tenants changing, but also the ways of working of people. And as you can see, the catchword for building tide parts is generality to allow flexibility for the activity tide parts. So coming from here, we divided the project into well, all the elements of the project into very clear categories, whether it was a general part or a flexible part, and how long the lifespan would have to be expected for this part in order for the building to be sustainable over time. So beginning from the top left, we have, of course, a structure, in this case, a concrete structure with a very life long lifespan, which is extremely general with an open floor plan. Uh, we have partly integrated with that um, thermal heating systems where we harvest water from the Hammarby Canal, canal uh, to cool the building in summer and to heat it in the winter, and thus activating the thermal mass even more than its original uh, characteristics. Uh, ventilation is um, low-pressure ventilation, so to, as to use uh, as little energy as possible and with good acoustics. And all the installations, both electrical and computer installations, are under the installation floor, so allowing a total flexibility of furnishing within the floor plan. The interiors are almost entirely made out of wood, which is a renewable material, but also, also gives warmth to the climate. The glazed facade offers unlimited views out, but it can also, of course, create problems with draft and overheating, depending on the time. To solve this, our eastern and western facades have a mobile sunscreen protection that comes down when there's a risk for, for overheating. They also come down during the very cold, clear night skies that we have in Stockholm to insulate the facade. To the south, being exposed to the sun a very big part of the, of the year and the day, we have fixed protruding balconies, allowing permanent views out and sun shading. And to the north, in Sweden, the sun never comes from the north, north so um, it's free from solar protection, and it allows the neutral northern light into the studios. A key for success in this project and in all projects in order to make a sustainable project is to really bring this topic up at the very, very beginning of the project. This is the phase where you have the biggest possibility of making an impact and actually giving the project a sustainable direction. And in order to do that, you need to analyze the prerequisites and the, the conditions on the site. You need to see what kind of renewable energy sources can we have, what materials are, uh, lo can we locally source to work with this, uh, how should we shape the building to adapt to its sites and to adapt to the climate. And as you understand, and also of course how it affects the city and all of that part, and as you understand, this is far too a complex task for one profession to handle. And this is why we work in interdisciplinary teams, integrating architects, interior architects, landscape architects, uh, environmental engineers, social anthropologists and artists in-house, and in all our projects, working on our architectural projects. Because a team of architects does not produce the same architecture as an interdisciplinary team with different uh, profession, professions. Sorry. Now this, of course, 
puts high demands on a controlled process because if you have all these different backgrounds, you're going to have very different kind of approaches. So we've developed our own innovation process, um, which clearly defines different phases with a defined phase, which is to rally all the stakeholders of the project, the clients, the municipalities, our team and our collaborators, to find and, and explore what, what are the questions that are raised and what, what's, uh, what's, what's the question at stake. The express phase is to define the goals for the project, and this is done together so that everyone is going in the same direction. Uh, the explore phase is the actual design phase where we try to find a solution to, to achieve these goals through design. And finally, the conclude phase is to select the final design, of course, and also to reflect on the process and the project as, as it has been. And the resu result today, this was delivered in 2003, and today, th 13 years later, it has um, fulfilled its, the environmental program. It has been certified at the highest national standard level that we have in Sweden, Miljöbyggnad Guld. And we have gone from being 100 working in this building to 300. So the structure has really proven its flexibility. But this is not only our office space. It is also uh, a part of the city and a part of Hammarby Sjöstad. Uh, and this being our particular building and us being inside, we use the roof as a test bed for ecosystem services. With, we have beehives with over 120,000 bees. We test and try out new facades, green facades, together with our clients. Our employees farm vegetables. And of course, there's an ongoing debate on the city of Stockholm and its development up here. Also, we have photovoltaic ins uh, installations that we regularly change. And at the bottom level, at the street level, we open up the building regularly to the city, inviting the uh, citizens of Stockholm for a dialogue to talk about the, the, um, the projects that we have, both to communicate what is happening to the citizens, but also to draw from their knowledge, because they are the true experts of what is needed in Stockholm and how it's developing. Now, in Stockholm, as in many other cities, as it's growing, both by densification and by extension, there is a growing need for public space of high quality. And this need, although the city might grow at the edges, it increases the most at the very core, because this is where everyone meets. And in Stockholm, as in many other parts, these parts are often listed for cultural and historic reasons. And in these cases, we need to, to make an impact, to improve the cities, to work towards the healthy city um, with much smaller means. And uh, I did not tell you this at the beginning, but I'm going to show you three projects. So this was the first one, a building. This one that's coming up now is a park, and we're later on going to see a full city plan. Because what really interests me with these questions is that it's the same tools, it's the same questions, no matter of the scale. It's like a giant fractal. You can zoom out as much as you want, and it's still the same thing that comes to, to mind. So this is a project for a small pocket park in the city of Stockholm. It's an unused piece of a street uh, that we transform uh, into a small place where people can be and that provides ecosystems and greenery in the city, thus enhancing the quality of life and, of course, the people density at street level. And uh, working on a project, a totally different project in New York, um, in Far Rock, um, a city an urban plan project, we coined a motto that was small means and great ends. And this is very much true for this temporary park that was uh, uh, opened this summer in Stockholm. It was built with only recycled materials. It was built by the project team and local volunteers in under a day. And uh, during the two months that it was open, it was host to a series of food trucks. Uh, school children, school classes came to play in the sandbox and plant flowers, and people just came to eat lunch in the sun. And this was also a very clear message that the healthy city is not a city for cars, it's a city for people. And finally, I would like you to take you far up north, 100 kilometers above the polar circle to Kiruna. You see Stockholm and Oslo down here. Uh, Kiruna is a mining town that uh, very much lives in some symbiosis with the mine. Uh, it's its only, it's its primary economic resource, you can say. So this is why the town is here. And you can see the mine and, and the, these quite beautiful formations from space to the left. However, the mine is digging ever deeper into the ground and is digging in under the city. 
So the scenario that is being played out right now is almost like a science fiction tale, where deformation lines grow from the west, eating up the city, you can say. And in 2033, so in less than 20 years, the entire core of Kiruna, with the town hall, the, the central place, um, and all the businesses, is going to be abandoned. You, you can't go there because it's too risky. Uh, and this is why the city of Kiruna launched an international competition to answer the question, how do you move a city in 20 years? So this is an entirely different context. It's a much larger scale, but again, it's the same principles that are in motion. So our first, um, first move, I would say, it was to expand the horizon. They asked for 2033, so 20 years, but a city isn't finished after 20 years, so we decided to look at 100 years. And this was very clear in this specific project, but it's true in all projects, that you have to look very way beyond the finished project to see the entire picture of sustainability. And this is an aerial, of course, of our winning proposal. Um, to start this project, we went to Kiruna with our social anthropologists, and we made uh, interviews and um, talked to the citizens to hear what do you like about your city, what are your hopes for the future, why are you living here? And the message was quite clear. Um, the people of Kiruna, they love, of course, it's a big, it's, it's one city, and then it's just nature for, for hundreds of kilometers in every direction. And people love the nature, and they want a close relation to nature. But they also want a dense city with public spaces, and this, of course, needs to be adapted to the subarctic climate. Our proposal really fulfills this need, bringing the nature to the doorstep of the dense city. And working in such an extreme climate, of course, you need to consider the use of the public spaces, both in summer and in winter, so that it remains a city for all year round. Now, the project in its entirety is very complex, and I don't have time to go into the specifics, but basically we have three strategies, all aimed to make Kiruna a model city for the future, and to make sure that during this process, the first 20 years, but also the 100 years to come, the city will not be split at any point. No one will be left behind. It's a plan that connects the existing parts and suburbs of Kiruna into one whole, because the city is always in motion. It's never finished. There is no period of construction where you can accept that the city is not one. In order to drive this process forward, we have invented the Kiruna portal right here, which is a physical place for recycling and reuse of building materials from the old town. Uh, this will be the place where you can actually see and really have the move be tangible. It's not only a way to, to sustainably reuse materials, but it's also a way to recycle memories, not to leave everything behind moving into a new city. And we have the Kiruna Biennale which is a proposal with, that seems to be um, fulfilled quite soon uh, with having a major event at Kiruna every second year in order to really draw inspiration and knowledge from this very specific project, a huge urban development project um, touching all the different uh, aspects of architecture and art and engineering. And finally, this is our studio in Kiruna that we opened this year to be able to continue this dialogue with the citizens. Um, we installed ourselves in a part of the current city center in an abandoned or in an empty um, commerce uh, space, commercial space, and we did the interiors using uh, housewares and building material that was donated by the residents in Kiruna, uh, both to emulate the Kiruna portal further on, but also to really get a sense of the place right now in the space where we're designing the future. Uh, moving a city like this is, of course, a huge challenge, and it both, brings both anxiety and anticipation with the citizens of Kiruna. Uh, so this is why this actually is functioning as a community center, with uh, informal coffee mornings, people just opening the door, coming in, talking about the situation today, when their house is going to have to be abandoned and such. But also, of course, more formal um, um, events where we uh, dialogue with the city. And my last image, Dominique, is um, just to say that through these images I've hoped to convey the idea that rather than using one style and putting it everywhere, no matter where we work, just because the challenges may be similar, we always seek that unique essence of a place, of the urban space, 
um, to find the hopes and possibilities of that particular place as the beginning for our work with creating an urban sustainable development. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Oscar, pour cette présentation.